This episode of the Legion of Games brought to you by the Planet Hoth. Come for the snow, stay for the Tauntaun Sushi. Hey, it's Chris. Let's do this. Kickstarter roundup. What's coming out? What is out there? Now, again, this week, not just Kickstarter, though, like I just slipped into crowdfunding roundup. Game found, Kickstarter, everything in between. So, what's out there? You know the big stuff that's coming. So, let's do a summary of what's on the scene. As always, thanks for watching. Tons of reviews this week. This was a review week. Wild Ascent, Millennium War, Red Rising, all in one week. I mean, can you ask for more? Well, you can, but I'm not going to do more. But that's besides that. Also, Monday morning, quarterback, hotness. That was from Monday, too. That was a double drop week. Again, just deadlines hitting there. I got a couple stuff coming out maybe in the next week, week and a half as well. It's going to be deadline specific. So keep your eyes as well. If you're interested in that, a couple new ones or ones that are either currently funding or will be funding very shortly. So again, just be aware. But that's enough ramble. As always, if you made it this far and you put up with my cheap jokes at the beginning, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for clicking. Let's do this. So this first one up, I'm giving shout outs to the small stuff every week. You know me. You know I do everything or I try to do as much as I can that actually looks like it has a chance at funding. So this is Explosion Card Game Bomb 24. Standard game replacing other things like Uno. And I'll say right now, I want this one to fund. Go check this out, guys. Um, this looks like, you know, if you want something party game esque, go check this out. I mean, it's only two thirds of the way funded. It's only looking for $900, but it's only like 13 bucks a pop and basically think Uno now replace it with a bomb that has a 24 count timer on it. And when it gets down to zero, you don't want to have, or you don't want to be the person with the bomb card. Cause then you lose and you want to have one of the safe cards and that's it. And the cards modify the time count. So you can see here pluses and minuses, and then there's a little bit of variable cards down here in terms of turning the order in which it's gonna go, changing it, shuffling it around. So, I mean, again, it's Uno just with a timer. So, I mean, if you were thinking Uno wasn't your favorite game because it can just go on perpetually, well, now there's a bomb and it's gonna blow up and it's gonna end the game. So uh, I think this would be a great party game. I think this would be great, it's super interesting. Again, like I said, 13 bucks. Um, plus shipping, I'd say go for it. I'm going to click remind me on this one. I hope you guys will check this one out too. Uh, we talk all the time about indie games being on here and getting made. And there you go. Explosion card game bomb 24. Looks awesome. <laughs> I love, I love this stuff. <laughs> uh, next is, uh, lock the game. And just on the periphery, it sort of gives me a little bit of like yinch vibes, but it's a two player strategy abstract game and you can see it's already almost 10 times its funding goal even with only 58 backers so what are you actually doing so this is a very interesting looking game um it's a very much abstract game and there's very little on the page it's 21 dollars. again i'm going to click remind me on this one too because you know how much i like abstract games at this point but the basic concept is you're playing these pieces on the board and you can lay them anywhere where there's an open intersection. And there are two win conditions. One, if you completely encircle somebody else's piece, meaning these lines that go towards the outside to the edge. You know, if you could trace a straight line, any one of the cardinal directions, straight lines out of where that piece is. If it can't without hitting somebody else's piece, you lose. Or if you have no pieces left in your hand to be able to play, you lose. Now, where's the nuance in this game? So you can see here in this example right here, this second illustration here. I'll pull it up so you can make it a little bit clearer here. And we'll blow it up as well here. If you form a triangle of pieces, any triangle of any pieces, what you do is you take one of them and replace one of your own with a wooden piece. And then you take another one completely off the board and it goes back into your hand. So you're potentially taking two things back into your hand. Now yours, somebody else's, that's where the nuance is. And then that's what you're left with this diagram to this diagram. So that is how you're playing and manipulating and doing so forth. So it looks simple. It looks straightforward. $21 is what you're going to get. You can also go at the higher level and get their previous game called Cloisters. I have no clue what that is. They don't really give a whole lot except a link to the previous one here. And this was off of a Make 100. So it looks like a little bit of another abstract game. 
So um, I'm not going to talk about that one because we're talking about currently funding. But again, uh, as a low funding abstract game and a lover of this indie style abstract ish in general, that is lock the game. Check it out. Next up, and I really like highlighting this one too, because this is by a creator I have backed in the previous iterations of Kickstarter. And this is called Five Gems, the board game. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is just a print and play. And this is by the gentleman over in Japan that made one of my other more recent favorite small box cooperative games. And that is Dragon Scary Go Round. Um, I have a review that's going to come out at some point, whether or not I actually get to editing it at all in the future. But that's out there. And it's it's great. It's great. I'd love to see that picked up by a modern publisher, although the price point would probably be a lot higher than what it was for that. So anyway, it's the same person who is doing five gems here. So I wanted to point that out. And this is Tanex is his name. And so this is what it is here. And, you know, it's very difficult to print the actual game. So he's basically giving you the print and play files for uh, five bucks. So and you can get his previous game if you're interested in Dragon Scary Go Round. And I think there's another one as well. Um, you can get it, a copy here. And, you know, if you like uh, deceptively complex or difficult uh, cooperative, very low overhead games, um, I recommend checking out Dragon Scary Go Round. Some people are obviously not going to like it, but it falls right under my sweet spot. So um, anyway, five gems, though. This is what we're talking about. got to stay on track here. Uh, family game, two to four players. Um, you exchange gems for other gems and collect as many as you can on the cards. There's five types and 12 different rules for exchanging the gems. You're going to be rolling and determining what exchange is going to be used that round. The winner is the one who has the majority in the most types. Um, the 12 exchange rules are narrowed down um, to a three or less by a die. So you can see here a little bit of what that's going to look like in the gem cards. Um, you know, again, full English rules that are there. You can already see, um, you know, my money is where my mouth is. I'm going to be saving this one and seeing what this is just because, you know, if he was probably printing this, I would probably be backing it right now just because I, I like the other game so much. And this is another one that I'm willing to take, uh, uh an expenditure on, if you will, uh, just because, and um, I'm just not a big, I can't do print and plays. I just can't like the cutting and the laminating and the putting together. Like, um, I just can't physically do it that well. So, um, that's my biggest issue from this, uh, altogether, but, um, yeah, dragon and mirror labyrinth. Uh, that's his other first game, I believe. And then here you go. Dragon scary go around again. I believe the rules are right here. So if you're interested at all by these, um, definitely check it out again. Like I said, review at some point by me, but, um, Five gems. There you go. This is a strong start this week. Uh, lots of low funding abstract, uh, looking very solid from that side of things. So I like highlighting those, especially Ganga River Rescue, a strategy board game set in India is the next one. Water conservation, history, geography affecting India's main river. So a metaphor for life, goals and objectives of the game. Uh, build living unit chains, whatever those are. Preserve river cards, collect goals, keep an eye on the competition. Um, you get a little bit of how to play here, full rule book. This is obviously clearly another super indie game. I mean, this just seems to be knocking it out of the park right now. And this one has more than the other ones. This one has 3000, um, 45 bucks for this 75 for the champion, 150 for the ultra eco benefactor. The link here that goes to the rule book actually links you to the game cracker page. If you want to get a little bit more information and you can watch the how to play video, which is relatively short. Um, so again, if this interests you, especially on the eco-friendly side of things, another indie game, um, there you go. Check it out. Next up is Game of the Year. I talked about that last week on my upcoming video. It's only about a third or quarter-ish of the way funded right now, uh, almost 100 backers. It is a board game about making video games where you are trying to make said video game of the year as a board game using certain features and certain amount of themes to incorporate in order to match and to combo. So let's take a look. 100% uh, Kickstarter exclusive. That's a big, um, bold statement. But, you know, a lot of these indie games, you know, really are. When we talk about it from the pre-order side of things, we're really talking about the companies that are very well established. Uh, whatever that looks like, you know, money aside. Um, so it's going to cost you $47. What are we getting here? Okay, golden age of video games. This is sort of a little meta here. How is it working? Build your game with themes and features, like I mentioned. Develop your company with specialist tokens and rewards that grant unique abilities. Sort of a little bit of a skill uh, unlocking tree, it looks like there. 
roll your dice to create your resources. So I mentioned those last week. All of these cards that you're using are going to have resources that you need to have. And then um, go against the competition, whatever that looks like. Read the rule book here. Now, when we go over to the rule book here, um, the main feature is that it takes place over three main rounds. Each round has the same structure of these different phases. Competition, pitching, development, release, cleanup. And then at the end, getting or determining who won in terms of that. They mentioned that there's going to be a solo, there's competitive, but there also is this two to three player cooperative version as well. So what are you actually doing in those phases? The first phase, you're just drawing cards to determine your competitors, as well as the available genres that you're picking from at the beginning of the game. Spend money in the second phase to upgrade or prepare your game by choosing those features, themes, and genre that I just mentioned. Then third phase, rolling those dice to get those resources. Um, then choosing the team that's going to be trying to implement the design of your game in the first place. Uh, determine your game's stars <laughs> rating, I guess, and the sales, collect any rewards, and then remove anything that you've used, uh, pay whatever costs you have from the development, and prepare for the next round, rinse and repeat three times total, and then you get to the end in terms of victory points. It's a 12-page rulebook, so I'm not going to give it a whole lot more depth there, but if you're looking for something that is a little bit meta on this side of things, that has a little bit of this um, management, uh, resource management with a little bit of uh, skill tree, essentially, with um, this sort of theme. Um, that is Game of the Year. Check it out. Next up, we have Potato Pirates 3 uh, Battle Chips. I mean, again, you can't make this stuff up. Um, $40,000 already funded. Um, I have no idea what this is. Let's check it out. 10 years old plus, 2 to 6 players, 36 minutes. Um... Coding and Pie of Potatoes. A uh, strategic card game where you zap potatoes for energy, dig for treasure, fortify powers and abilities. Okay, okay, interesting. How are you playing? Favorite captain, eliminate all your enemies. Um, Art of Potato War. And see what you can do. Choose your captain. Before the game starts, there you go. Each captain is asymmetric. Then, as a second phase, you're going to be building your ship. And this is where the nuts and bolts of this game are, because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be choosing the strategy here and arming it, and you're going to be doing this differently each round. And this is where also the powers are going to play, because the combination of these two things is where the coding comes in, because you're going to have coding phrases allowing you to do different things, allowing you to act different ways, allowing you to even repeat actions depending on how you code it and again choosing your powers running through the actual attacks of what you've programmed and then not the internet the spud net here is going to be able to help you get upgrades so um, then you can do that now you get the kickstarter edition and the retail edition it basically has a lot of more upgraded stuff player boards the tokens the character cards the ship tokens and then you see the retail edition which just has sort of the regular card versions of everything if you will um, then they talk about an online app with the Caribbean Seas. They run through some of the previous games that they had here, as well as some of the actions that you're going to be doing um, in terms of explaining it in computerese while still um, giving it context to the game. So you can try and go through all of these. And it just does a nice uh, explanation there. And why back? Okay, Kickstarter Limited. Add-ons here, a little plushy stuff. Can you get the previous game? Yeah, it looks like you can get the previous base game. Um, and then shipping is going to be what it's going to be. America, okay, yeah, it's fine. It's uh, relatively low. So that's all that this entails. Um, it is definitely something different. I mean, the last thing I saw that really used coding to any extent was that Robot Turtles game that I think originally funded on Kickstarter and then hit retails mass market, I think like in Target and stuff. So this seems a little bit more like a step up because that was just action programming in a sense. This seems more like actual coding, not just action programming, but it's worth noting. Um, if you have any interest in getting your kids involved with coding, um, this might be that gap instead of just having them go read a C++ book, right? So, anyway, Potato Pirates 3 Battle Chips. Check it out. Epic Spell Wars of Battle Wizards, a Nylogdon 2. And this is by Cryptozoic, and this has some sort of cult following, I think, with the first one. Um, and it's already raised five times its funding goal, $50,000. So we're getting up there in terms of things that I wouldn't expect. Um, let's check the price point out at the beginning out of curiosity. $40, um, extreme with this standalone sequel, 55 gets you the expansion, 110 gets you the all in a whole bunch of other stuff. 
play mat, bag, power chips, trophy. Okay, so a whole bunch of stuff. Um, this is basically just like OP everything cards your wizards and you attack each other, I believe. Um, more intense, more vicious, um, more la nacho, I guess is what it's saying. Tons of just more stuff. Everything goes into overdrive with this second row of cards. Uh, over the top cards. So just everything more expensive, more powerful. Everything you're going to get, 249 cards. Um, use your starting cards. You get power to buy more, more powerful cards. Use those cards to buy even more powerful cards and just do a lot of take that. It's just crazy ultimate wizard fun uh, with deck building and combos. Um, like this is one I'm probably going to have to click remind me on. Like I don't know the actual like ish gameplay on the first one. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be the target audience or if this is a little bit too silly for me. I'll probably check out the rule book after this uh, video ends to get some more information. Um, the very interestingly titled expansion there. Uh, another 109 cards. So... I mean, like, I'm just not sure this is, like, kid-friendly, you know? So that would be my other thing right now is I'm trying to do more of that appeal and unique ways to get guys all sorts of craziness, all sorts of more craziness, another rule book for the expansion. So, I mean, I like that they have all the information out there. But, you know, regardless, um, it's getting support, and regardless, people seem to like it. So, um, yeah, I just glanced at the rule book, and this is totally not <laughs> kid-friendly at all. So um, I'm probably going to pass on it, but if you just like pure chaos with the deck building that is in line with the other Cryptozoic products that I've seen uh, with deck building aspects, um, yeah, check it out. It's not for me after looking at it real briefly, but um, I'll mention it because people like it. So there you go. Epic Spell Wars, number two. Next up, we have Tranquility, the standalone sequel to the previous game, Tranquility. This is Tranquility, The Ascent. And so what is Tranquility the Ascent? Um, this is one of those games, one to five player, it's a cooperative card game where you are basically building this mountain um, representing your ascension up the side of it as a climber. This is one of those games where I look at and I go, I'd love to try this because I don't know based on just a description because... You know, nowadays, I feel like a lot of the time we know, like, you look at something and you go, oh, yeah, that appeals to me, and you go a little deeper. Oh, yeah, that really appeals to me. Or you go, oh, no, I can clearly tell this doesn't. This is one of those where the thought of it appeals to me, but I can't really tell if it actually would be enjoyable. So what are you doing here? So in Ascent the Card Game, you are taking these cards, like I mentioned, and you are layering them next to each other horizontally and then vertically. Now, the caveat is that you can't have two of the same tiles touching each other in terms of what color they are, or i.e. the terrain. The other thing that you have to do is you'll notice that there are two different numbers on these, and so that's the other thing you're going to be managing, because if you lay down a 5 next to a 3, you have to discard the difference, and you'd have to discard two cards from your hand, so you have to, in order to do that, you have to be able to manage that side of things as well. And you're doing left to right... And so you have to go all the way across and then up all the way across and then all the way up across until you reach the peak, the summit, if you will. And so what this game is doing is this is adding modularity to the first game as well. And the first one is that you're adding a green path, meaning you must have a continual path green from the very top all the way down to the very bottom. Again, adding a degree of difficulty. Then the second one, is that there are these panoramic views along the way that you have to specifically put out in certain places and cross them at certain points in order to achieve the certain objective. And there are a total of six. And then the last one, you have to coax a goat up the mountain that doesn't really want to go. So that is what you're getting. You get additional promos if you're going to be backing on Kickstarter as well. And the copy of Just Ascent is going to only cost you 24 bucks. Um, and the copy of base game is not included right here. I don't know. Okay. Looks like you can't get just the base game as a pledge level. Interesting. Um, stretch goals right there. Full rules right there. Um, and you can check it out online. So they give options there. A uh, couple of videos here of actually what it is. A couple of written reviews. Shipping is what it's going to be at this point. And there you go. Um, just all in all, very straightforward, very uh, zen-ish like game. A little bit of thinky, a little bit of peace, 
A um, little bit of color matching. A little bit of re engine, not really engine, a little bit of resource management. So um, anyway, that is Tranquility, The Ascent. And you don't need the base game because it's standalone, like I said at the beginning. Duh. Next up, we have Champions of Akathena. Now, they talk about this just based on the description. Team-based, diceless arena combat. It sort of gives me the vibe of Mythic's game with their head-to-head -head skirmish battler. So, let's kind of take a look at it. It has almost like a chess-like board down there. Okay, so, again, with these games, you always hear me say, <laughs> as I feel like an echo machine, what makes this different? What makes this unique in terms of why I should back this one over other ones? Okay, six champions. Okay, a couple minis, a couple unique boards. Treasure that you're going to be adding. Tokens. Okay, great. Okay, little terrain. There are your champions. Your little magical deck. How do you play? It reminds me, just based on the description, of a couple other skirmish games that have come out uh, recently where you're using your cards and you have four actions per turn in terms of what you can do. Attack special actions, draw cards, or move. And so you're just straight up doing that. You have a champion who has special cards that are upgraded versions of the basic actions, and it appears that there is going to be some take that, because they mentioned that your hero or your champion cards specifically cannot be discarded, so there must be some element of that that is possibly done. And then your reinforcements that are along with your champion um, that are present, so you're not just taking like necessarily just champions. Uh, early bird bonus is going to be done by the time you guys see this video. Um, regardless of behind the scenes PDF. Okay, great. And what is it going to cost? $20 gets you a PDF copy to print and play. $40 is a copy of the core. And $75 gets you two copies. Okay. That's about it. Got some stretch goals down here. No videos. I don't see a rule book. Um... I would be interested to see it again just to know what the differences are and to see what some of these specific actions are um but that is champions of akathena next up is sandwich masters bread rolls i believe this is a relaunch because i feel like i'm having deja vu all over again and this is a bread based game obviously as you can tell where you have ingredient cards for building your sandwiches and attacking other people's sandwiches and trying to catch them with the culinary inspector so um just everything that that entails um trying to build sandwiches to match what is ordered and a couple of videos here to go over what you're doing um your dealt cards everything that you may see here Four cards are dealt face up. The more ingredients uh, the order requires, the greater reward. So those are sort of your quest cards, if you will. And you build um, up to four sandwiches in front of you and beginning with bread, obviously. Um, the customer can't tell the difference, but if you use bad ingredients, the health inspector can punish you. Um, you can even be sabotaged by attack condiments. So definitely a mix of what to expect there. Um, new roll cards, basically adding a little bit of asymmetry, it appears. And let's see um don't nope, just run through what it is lots of videos uh 10 pounds if you just want the expansion 25 pounds if you want everything so uh there you go bread rolls it's uh about a quarter of the way funded check it out next up is the expansion to villagers this one is shifting seasons which it is coming with more modules again modules seem to be the theme this week as we saw with uh tranquility so what modules is this one actually adding? Again, one to five players, building your village, recruiting villagers to build the best combos. You know, sort of a sieve builder in a short, you know, card-based style. Okay, so what are you actually getting here? You are wider variety, more scoring opportunities, adding one round, and additional rules, again, you know, with a note that it is going to be adding more minimum, just integrating it with what's out there. And this is the second, I believe, big box expansion, new modules, event cards. So you have a little bit of that seasons, potentially along with, you know, other, you know, specific events like festivals, weddings, uh, caravans, envoys, you know, special arrivals, that sense, teams, uh, team builder, uh, there you go as well, special villagers, extra specials, and the clay suit. Um, a whole new suit to play with. And then they're also, for all you solo players, they're adding a monastery mode. So they run through what's in there. They run through the rule book, a bunch of stretch goals because they've already funded, what, over 100,000 at this point already. 
uh, which is three times their funding goal. Because I know this game, although it's definitely not of my ilk, it's definitely well thought of. And I know people were super excited by this. Here are the prices. Um, so 15 euros, 18 US bucks uh, gets you the expansion. So very reasonably priced. I don't know how this compares in terms of the other stuff. And this is a little bit of everything. So including promos too. So there you go. Uh, add-ons, add-ons, add-ons. That's the previous expansion that I mentioned. And there you go. Coin chest, playmat, promos, individual promos. I mean, everything. Bunch of videos, again, because this is an expansion, so there's going to be a lot of stuff out there. So, there you go. That is everything you need to know about the expansion for Villagers Shifting Seasons. If you like it, looking like more of a good thing. If it's not your thing, easy pass. Next up, Millennium War. Now, again, <laughs> spoilers. Uh, full disclaimer, uh, I had a copy, have a copy, whatever tense you want to use. Uh, my video is, I believe, down there at the bottom. And it is, you know, this was an interesting one. It's already, you know, not a third of the way funded, but probably about a quarter of the way funded. And again, it was a lofty goal. So we'll see what happens. It definitely, as I said in my video, reminds me a little bit of Sheol, the S-H-E-O-L game with the shadows and the sort of uh, tower defense-esque where it had a slow start, but it was able to fund. And so we'll see what happens with this one. Um, this is a MOBA game where it takes the MOBA side of things where you're choosing four champions and going head to head against four champions, but also having some PVE in there in terms of fighting creatures, because there are three different modes in which you can win. You can knock down all of the ancient towers. You can knock out all the person's heroes on the other side, or you can knock out six of the individually typed elements of level two creatures. So that's the different way you can win. Also, there is a head to head uh, cooperative mode in terms of fighting a boss. And so this page is just absolutely massive. I mean, as I said in my video, this is spectacular art. The concept is tremendous. It is intuitive in terms of some of the gameplay itself. But I also felt initially it was a little bit slower to start and a little bit lacking there and just a little bit too ambitious. I mean, that's the too lazy didn't watch version of my video, but I think it has great, great potential. And they have all of these bosses designed up for the competitive mode. So I only had one in mind. So I would be interested to see how all of them differ. I mean, you can tell just by the appearance of them, uh, in terms of the landscape and the boards, um, there's going to be big differences there. Um, but there wasn't really addressed either. The rule book was okay. Um, there was a lot of uh, gaps, and I think I had one of the older rule books, so I'm I know I'm missing some there. Um, there you go, first 48 hour uh, backer exclusive there. Um, there we go. Wow, blue on the board. Um, I think that's from my unboxing though, because I was late with my review. That makes more sense. Okay. Um, yep, there's my unboxing, and maybe they'll link my review at some point too. Uh, but that just came out this morning, so I wouldn't be surprised. I was a little um, just, you know, crammed with things. And they did a really good job. And they have a lot of cool stuff here. These dials are really cool. Um, they work really well. And the powers themselves are really cool. Um, but this is also not a game where you just sort of pull it together and just grab four random guys and go. You really need to look for synergy because they are really different. And you can end up like I do sometimes with a completely unbalanced team that doesn't work. So, uh, Kickstarter pledges, uh, I mean, this is the standee and this text is really hard to read. Uh, God pledge core plus miniature set is 250. The core pledge without miniatures is 110. And I think, as I also mentioned in my video, my biggest concern with this is just, um, are you trying to do too much bloodstone, you know, the PVE and the PVP? Um, because I think again, the concept looks amazing and I think it has such great potential. I just don't know how much of this is uh, a finished product and how much is going to be adaptable and changeable. And so that was my biggest hesitation right now. And the acrylic arts, um, the acrylic standees are great, but I kind of wished it matched the art that's on some of these other cards that you saw uh, me scroll by and some of this art on the box and it just doesn't. And so that was a little, you know, it was a little weird uh, because I, I honestly, I don't mind either, but I just wish they matched. Um, Again, the setup system is great. Um, again, it runs through all of the heroes here. That's why it's so long. So uh, and then it runs through some of the bosses as well. Again, just this is just an absolutely massive, massive page. You can tell it's even having trouble keeping up. Yeah. 
I, I really like the concept. And, and if this one doesn't fund for some reason, I mean, like I said, this is saved already in mine. I'm going to be checking this out on the last day. I want to see what they do. Are they going to address or answer some of my concerns? Um, but they've been responsive um, so far. So, um, I mean, whoa, there we go. I uh, wasn't expecting that. But um, yeah, so we'll see. Um, overall, I I want to see them succeed because I think, like I mentioned, this looks like a very, very good concept and they put a lot of time and effort into this. But again, uh, but again, they're going up against a very crowded market right now too. So uh, we'll see. I'm going to keep a close eye on this one. One day more, if you're interested, check it out. Next up, we have Hollywood Racers, the reboot. Um, I covered this one, what, like a week or two ago? So this is not a lot of downtime between. But they had like an eighty dollars or $90,000 goal last time. And you can see clearly here that that has been significantly reduced. Now, I guess the question when I see that is always, first and foremost, like, why? Why was the first one so high? And how are you getting away with doing the second one so low? Especially when you're talking like four times the difference. Um, because, I mean, I think there is support for a game like this. Um, it's a crazy, um, play taking place, a race in a studio, um, with all sorts of these parodies that are included anywhere from, um, two to five player. And I think that with the parodies out there, people are going to be interested. Uh, you build the track, however you want, you choose your drivers, you choose your starting vehicles, and you just kind of go, you have special abilities that you can attack people with the terrain interacts with you. Um, you're trying to upgrade, you're trying to avoid obstacles. Um, it's, it's, it's good. And we'll see what happens with it. It looks like you can get this. And then it looks like, I think, Primo Backers. I think that was, this was a game that was funded previously and like never delivered. And so they picked it up and they're trying to deliver it to the people who backed it previously. And so I think that was part of the price point um, first time around. But apart from that, I can't speak. And I think that's what this Racers of the Lost Arena subtext says here. New backers can get it as an add-on. Um, and I think, I think honestly, that's probably the best thing is because they had the metal minis included last time and that might be the biggest um i don't really need this as a superfluous like luxury item and so if you're getting a lot more people that are just getting at this level uh or even this level even uh you know you're just giving them the option so i think that's great it runs you through everything that's in there again i'm not a racing person racing games do nothing for me but this is definitely something different in aesthetic as well as how it plays so if this is really of your ilk, uh, check it out. It's Hollywood Racers, the reboot. And I like what they've done so far. Speaking of reboots, we have Velocity Vanguard, the relaunch. Again, like $70,000 goal. This is the epic, you know, space traveling, space faring, space combat sort of game. And so again, my question is always, what has changed, as I just mentioned, from last time? One to four players, solo co-op and cooperative. So again... Take that for what you will. I just mentioned that with Millennium War. Sometimes too much is too much. Story-driven, mission gameplay. They go through some of the background, some of the lore, choosing your factions. All four of them come in the box, and they talk about it being more of a sandbox-style game. And again, sandbox-style games, as much as they sound good, they have to be very well thought out. Uh, they talk about the configurations of how you're actually choosing your ships here, which is really appealing. Uh, but I'm also not a big space person as much as I like the concept. I don't actually do a whole lot of practicality with it. Uh, launching your ship, assigning your crew, effects, objectives, what's in the box? $79. Again, $79 for everything that you see here is not probably a bad deal with how much you're getting. And so this is one of those where I go, okay, so why isn't this one funding? Now, if you want more ships, okay, there you go. Large playmat, again, there you go physics-based movement that they had talked about previously, scenario-driven, as I mentioned, up top. So missions that are going to be either cooperative you know, or competitive, and multiple difficulties as well. Um, they run through everything here. As I've said, I like seeing this. I like showing me how it actually plays. They have a rule book. They have a bunch of videos. Uh, why is this one not getting more traction? I have no idea. Shipping is what it is. I mean, this is not going to be a small box, I don't think. So I'm not really surprised that it's going to be 30 bucks. But I, I I, don't know. It has everything that I would expect from that, except for some of the hype. And I just don't know why it's not having that. Either way, I wish them luck. And if you're interested in more of the SpaceX side of things, that's Velocity Vanguard. Check it out. Speaking of things I've previously talked about, this is Battle Peak. This was sort of the wizards on top of a mountain blasting at each other. 
Uh, it's only at about 10% of its funding goal, so we'll see where that heads. But it is, you know, taking one of the four elements, mastering it, throwing at it at your opponents, trying to either knock them out or knock them off. As you can see here, a hex-based mountaintop that you're going to be using, and then it runs through all of the different spells, and it looks like there's at least four spells of each element there that you can play and that are going to be able to interact. You've got the element cards, the dust piles that are going to be, you know, influencing as well. And just examples of everything else that's going to be in there because you can also influence the terrain itself to give a secondary effect uh, how you can attack or influence your opponents in their play. You start with three health tokens. You get two actions per turn. You can do the same thing more than once. Uh, focus, move, cast a spell, dust piles. If you've used those spells, uh, you unlock even stronger spells by, you know, your mastery in them in the first place. How to play, again, a couple videos, a couple upgrades in terms of stretch goals, again, more videos, and everything is there. So, I mean, it's not a complex game. It's another one of those that I go, is this just the fact that it's just so crowded? Is this a uh, head-to-head? -head? Do people not want a lot to take that? I don't know. Because if I was casually strolling along this, this would be appealing to me, but I also don't have a big crowd to play this with. Uh, in terms of always the head-to-head -head combat, my kids are a little bit averse to that right now. I haven't really completely won them over. And um, I don't know. It's just one of those where I wonder if, just like the previous two I mentioned, a relaunch is going to go a lot better. Because the price point, I think, is relatively respectable and good. Yeah, $40. A little bit more than I would have expected. But so be it. Uh, but it is what it is. Check it out if you're interested. That's Battle Peak. Next up, we have Escape from the Asylum. I talked about this one because we're just going through all of those in a row at this point. This is an import game that didn't ever really found English translation up until now for the most part. And this is a one to six player cooperative game that you are taking the role of a prisoner in this asylum and you are, well, clearly trying to escape. Now, this is the very interesting thing that is a whole part of my next week's uh, Monday morning hotness discussion. They're accepting dog coin. So doggy coin, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Second game, Red Outpost was their previous one. Part one, part two. It's an escape room game. Two parts. Each has five stories in it. Like I mentioned, you're trying to escape. You have to solve puzzles, make decisions that are going to change things. Review more, get more of the backstory and watch as you go. Dice Tower had one of the English copies from a couple years ago. They really liked it. They really liked it, overwhelmingly liked it, uh, said it was probably near the top of the escape room style of games. So if you like escape room style of games, I think you almost have to check this one out just based on the little that we know. Four page rule book is right here. So if you have any interest, everything you need to know is right here. They tell you a little bit of unboxing here so you just can kind of get the gist of it without spoiling things. So what is the price going to actually be right now? Deluxe version, all the stretch goals and the content. Okay, that's interesting. Is a thousand copies and fifty-four dollars. The base is forty-five. And is there something else? Nope, it's just two. Okay. So what all you're getting? What are the stretch goals? Short reviews, previews, previews, previews. Full walkthrough. Spoilers if you really want it. Stretch goals. Here we go. Okay. UV, foil, limited edition, limited edition. Okay, nothing there that really makes me think I need the deluxe. Unless there's other deluxe actual content that I'm missing. Because I don't actually see a breakdown of the pledge levels here. So, that would be the only question. Is what else is in that deluxe pledge level? But, I mean, clearly, again, like, exit style games are really hot right now. And it shows $22,000 already raised. That is Escape from the Asylum. Next up, The Great Chase. Co-op tabletop game. One to six players. I have no clue what this is. I have no clue who Miranda Chase is or what her novels are. Uh, but it is already 70% funded, so let's check it out. So what do we got going here? Okay, I'm going to get it to you by the end of the year. Card driven. What are we actually doing here? It's assuming you not, haven't read the books, which is good. Because I clearly haven't. Race around the world. Air crash investigation team. Solving crashes in diplomatic cases. Uh, players versus game. Solo as well okay what are you doing here okay here's what you're getting a few stretch goals stretch goals more stuff stretch goals more stuff add-ons i still haven't seen how to play the game even though i saw a rule book up there we'll come back to that in a second a few written reviews and that's about it it looks like i mean there's two vague videos down here 
uh, of how the cards were made. So let's go back up here and check out the rule book. So here's a little bit of how you're actually playing. You set it up in terms of the missions and you put down the number of characters and you're trying to solve these various things. You're moving around the map, negotiating which characters are going first. You have two skills, movement and crew. And so that's a little bit of how you're interacting there. And then you have traits that alter, you know, those problem solving skills and the navigation in the first place. Diplomatic emergency must be delivered. So you're having to navigate bringing this to the right place. Um, again, studying it, you know, how you're going to be able to manipulate these around to get them in the right areas is just the gist of the game. Uh, there is a little bit of die rolling I saw, so you just got to be careful. Uh, end of turn, that's about it. Advanced play, there's a little bit of difficulty challenges there, but in a nutshell, that's the game. So that is The Great Chase, co-op tabletop game. Check it out. Next up, we have Little Nutters, the card game. Um, let's see what we got here. It is a early bird until July 3. You're getting a couple extra cards. This is sort of a multi-layered memory, but not really memory. It's a multi-layered card game where you've got this tableau, as you can see in the picture right here in front of you, and you're going to be trying to gather these cards up and get some of the nuts that are in there and use other creatures and attacks or items essentially to fend off the others, but you're also going to be trying to avoid both the animal attacks as well as the obstacles that you're going to run into eventually that can either end your turn or take you out, potentially. So again, the boosts, the trouble that you run into, uh, yes, right there, uh, characters and the nut containers that they're uh, calling. And so, I mean, that's basically what you're going to be doing. And the three actions that you're going to be using are dig, excavate, and search. Digging is just you're taking the top card and you get it, whatever it is. If it's a nut, you place it into your container. If it is a defense, you place it into your hand. If it's an animal or an obstacle, like I mentioned, see if you survive. Excavate, though, allows you just to pick up the top two cards and just put them in your hand. And as the text illustrates, why don't you just do that every time? Well, you have to discard two cards from your hand, so you're going to run out of cards in your hand to do that. Then one discarding allows you to search as the last action, and then you can just peek at the top card to know whether or not you should grab it later. Um, playing a little bit further, a little bit of a video, and then the pledge level, which is $25 Canadian for it. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Didn't even realize that. Uh, little Nutters. I wish I was that clever to actually put puns in that um, were intentional. Next up is Tactum Invictus. This is a very interesting style of game as well. It's almost 50% funded. It is a tile laying, tile maneuvering in the light of a legion of the Roman army where you are going head to head against other tiles in a two player straight up strategic level game. Sort of like a Stratego um in a next level sort of thing because what you're going to be trying to do is use your commander use your legionnaires and use your cavalry to essentially uh play whatever scenario you want flank is essentially how you capture the other person's pieces and try to be the last one standing and they talk about you being able to create your own scenario with resources here. They don't talk about a lot of the resources on the actual game page, but it says, okay, with your individual movements, you can move orthogonally as far as you want. You can form formations because obviously it's a little bit harder to flank one character like that. Column though, I mean a lot easier. Defeating or capturing, flanking or bracketing. Now it says you have to be careful though because you can capture more than one unit in that way, uh, but that's just what you have to do. And it gives you a little bit of examples here on how to set up and then it talks about the advanced training here as well uh senators are additional blue and red training forces for your additional uh, play style um but that's about it there's not a whole lot of rule book there's no video in terms of how that's actually going to be managed uh so it's interesting that it's already got three thousand. i mean i think that's a very interesting concept and from an abstract style of of manner it's very cool so we'll see. I mean, obviously, without a rule book, without a little bit of how this actually plays in terms of those resources, those advanced rules, those scenarios, a more explicit explanation of how many can you bracket at a time? Can you only bracket one unit? Can you bracket a full column, a full square like that if you can get them you know, on both sides? I need more information. So if it shows more information, if you get an update or two that talk about that more, you know, I'd be feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, but again, if you're interested in this, at least, you know, remind me, check it out. There you go. Okay, we're going to power through these last couple. Potion Panic. 
Uh, you are crafting your chaotically in kind potion crafting. And you are using a recipe building card game, two to four players. 13 potion cards, 40 recipe cards, a plethora of variability is what they're calling it. Again, uh, 86 total there with 13 uniques, uh, the shards that you're getting. I love this. Who doesn't love reading rules? I, I love I love how every page nowadays too, and no one's going to see this part anyway of the video, but um, every page has to make sure you get in the rule book and the graphic like as if we're going to leave the rules out. So what are you doing? You're getting three potion cards, a private recipe that only you can craft, three public recipes, prep, smash, brew. And prep means just placing it face down on the, one of the spots in your workbench. Uh, in order to activate its ability, smash it or craft the recipe, brew, you must have the cards prepped first. Okay, straightforward. Flip it face up, take the smash effect, resolve it, and then discard it and any effective cards back to the potion stack. Now, is it going to affect your cards? Okay, two main cards from the main deck. So it's going to give you that ability. Brew is taking all of the brew actions, reveal all face down, and if it satisfies the requirement, uh, you get the shards and you keep on crafting. Reserve. So, I mean, it's sort of like Splendor where you just reserve your own thing there. Um, yeah. There you go. Color accessible, but also shape accessible. And price point here is $20. Yep. Awesome. So, there you go. A little bit different take on the engine building card playing uh, style mechanism. Potion Panic. Next up, Tataka is a Samurai Showdown. And I'm assuming this is a two-player game. Although it says three to five player right here, if I would actually read it more. It is a take on Paper, Scissor, Rock, essentially, because it seems like you are going to be taking cards, drafting them, passing them around until you have 10 cards. Battle phase where you play strategically one card from your face down uh, pile, and you can either attack, block, or perform another action. So whatever the other actions are, that's where the Paper, Scissor, Rock variation is. You're strategically bluffing, you get to attack, and if you do damage, and if you get the last hit on another opponent, you get an honor point, first one to two honor points wins. There's bluff, there's misdirection, there's alliances, um, some pretty cool looking art there, just for an indie style game, and that's where they say a lot of their money is going to be going as an indie game, and yeah, there you go. So, let's see, no video, no gameplay, I'd like to know a little bit more of what some of the cards are going to do, $25 for a game. Uh, 55 for a signature edition, but you scribble your names on the box. At least they're honest about it. I like that. Uh, 1700 bucks. Uh, just show me more on the page, guys. Show me a rules. Show me something else to make me interested and to delineate this. I mean, you've got 50 backers and 1700 bucks, which is no small feat, but I just need more. So there you go. Check it out. Getting close to the end here of Kickstarters. Uh, this is Altia, a trick-taking game. You saw me talk about a little bit for last week. Uh, three people we are trying to save the planet from extinction it is almost funded this is one of those japanese indie games this uh as they say sold really really well in their spring market because i believe they do two or three markets every year now with the pandemic it was sort of shut down but these games are like it says very popular these are games that you usually just if you don't get them at the market whenever they're available during that season during that specific market sometimes they never come around again so the fact that they're doing this is really cool um, they didn't have enough money to, at the time, to provide the game to all the people who visited our booth. And like I said, that's what happened. And they wanted to do an English version be, due to requests. So I love seeing this. Okay, so what are you getting? Altia is a planet secretly between Sun and Mercury. Okay, so you're saving that planet, essentially. Um, despite the king's wishes, the princes plan to outsmart the other brothers. An information war for the planet now begins. So what are you actually doing here? It looks like what you're doing is secretly bidding, and that's replacing discarded cards on the field and a portion of cards in the hand, creating what it says is a game of guessing the opponent's hand and declaring your own bid. So, you set your own victory condition for the next phase, discarding cards, getting more cards to replace the cards in your hand. Then, the three players who set the highest score win condition, and the other two players play their tricks. First player to reach the target score wins the game. That's, that's interesting. I mean, I'm... If you know, I'm a minimalist in some of this art, so I really like that. Uh, yeah, it's going to have Japanese and English, like a lot of these do. Components in acrylic in the premium edition. That's cool. And they're going to have some stretch goals. So this is one I definitely think you should check out if you like trick-taking at all. 
Uh, shipping April 2022. That's that's more time than I would have expected. But also, you know, this is their college. I mean, they're college students, right? So that's cool. And what is it going to cost you? Early bird, if there's uh, 12 left right now at the time of doing this, 17 bucks and 19 bucks if you get the standard. Special edition components are going to cost you just 23 bucks. So that's great. That's a great price. Uh, now with the shipping being a little bit easier, uh, especially if you do like freight shipping with my last Japanese game from Kickstarter, uh, shipping was like five or 10 bucks. So well worth it. Um, you know what? I am going to back this as soon as the video ends right here. So don't watch anyway, but that's it. That's Altia. Now I'm done with Kickstarters. So the time you've been waiting for, let's go. So here it is. Here is Levon Rising Wild Ascent Expansion Campaign Version. Now, I want to say that I just put it at the end of the video so you guys would click this part of the video and then watch a little bit before, the watch after. I wasn't that smart. I just honestly uh, did all the Kickstarters and realized I got to the end of this video and said, oh yeah, I should probably do this one considering it was probably the biggest name launching this week and the fact that it's probably the biggest money. It's got $730,000 at this point. It is three quarters of a million dollars. So what is it? I mean, they're hitting stretch goal after stretch goal. The other Lazy Square games have done similarly. Now, what they're doing here, if you're not familiar with Wild Ascent, I'll link my review up above so you can get a sense of what this one to four player dungeon crawler in the fantasy scheme, KDM light style adds to the genre. But that is essentially what they're doing. Now, the issue that this brought about is they were not available and they could not use the molds that were originally with this game and so they've gone a whole new process so it's a whole new edition essentially and the question was going to be how was that received well i mean it's got three quarters of a million dollars so you you can take that for what you will i don't know where it's going to end up and again the question is how is that going to compare to the original wild ascent so let's break this down a little bit okay Got the pledge level featured up here, 72 hour early bird. So if you're not backing, you should, well, actually you might be a little too late at this point. If you're watching this video early enough in the day, you should be able to still get this. It's this miniature little expansion add-on guy, Mist Terror, I believe is what they're calling it. Pretty strong actually. Anyway, so noon, if I just would read one of these times, noon on July 2nd. So if you're watching this video before noon and you're interested, Pledge, you can always cancel. So, you're putting it back in, you're making it better. Okay. Board Game Co., he sent me his copy of the small portion of campaign that is Levon Rising. So, hopefully, by at the latest this time next week, I will have a video out talking about my feelings on that. How much time do I have, by the way? Ooh, six days. Okay, so it's going to be a tight squeeze. So, we'll see. Anyway, so day two, join the hunt. Uh, unlocking stretch goals, I think. Are they doing unlocks too? I forget. You know how much I, I'm scatterbrained. Anyway, so these are the pledge levels. Core game, Shadow Silverstrand, Dangers of the Wild, Levon Rising Expansions. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. Just the core, core plus Silverstream, and that's it. These miniatures look much better than the first ones as well. I'm completely okay with that. So you're getting a little bit of picture of all of the unlocks here, just adding more stuff, which, I mean, again, looks great. Uh, you get a little bit of the lore books, a little bit of the single expansion guy there. Graphic novel. My son would probably be, that's probably a little bit too old for him. So it tells you what you're getting there. It tells you what you're getting here with all the stretch goals. And this is the second pledge level. And then this is the, I mean, you know, you're getting seven boxes worth of stuff for 369 So is it expensive? Yeah. Is it a lot of content? Yeah. So the question is just, can you break that down any further? Levon Rising, here you go. 100 page decision-based narrative campaign, multiple adventures, multiple endings, impactful choices and stories. So new mechanics, including equipment specializations, uh, pass and customizing your hunt mode and extra large creatures. Uh, I will not have one of the extra large creatures, FYI, but uh, <laughs> it just didn't get sent along with the rest of the package. Uh, which he, he sent me a message. Alex sent me a message afterward. He's like, oh, sorry. It was behind me. a huge, like dragon or something. I, you know me though. That's not a big deal. Like I, I'm not a big miniature person anyway. So like I'll, I'll pull like something from else from like a, like Simon game or something. And I'll have it down there or some KDM guy and I'll put it on the board and you can see it. Uh, but anyway, so this is the core. This is all the redone stuff with the seekers and all the assets and everything that you're going to be getting. Uh, what else do you need to know here? Again, a lot of cool stuff and a lot of different stuff as well. 
So all the core stuff that we saw before. Okay, here is, yep, Silverstream. Let's get to the Levon Rising stuff. Again, that, oh, maybe this is the dragon he's talking about? I don't know. Or maybe the other one down here. <laughs> Twin Dragon. I wonder if that's it. If it is, man, that's cool looking. Okay, anyway, Levon Rising. Here we go. And yeah, here it is. I mean, it says 149. So yeah, okay. So my question answered. So Levon Rising 149, just right there by itself. Okay, so all of the cool stuff there and all of the other stuff that's going to go along. Ooh, that one. That is awesome. I I think I like the first one better. Anyway, again, you're not here for my opinions on miniatures. Or it was it that? Anyway, that's the same one. Okay, I'm getting distracted easily. I'm like a dog, like shiny squirrel. Anyway, so all of the more stuff, the specialization equipments, the more boards, the more maps, which I think is cool, especially if you're going to have more terrain effects. Um, you know, there's one sort of terrain effect that does a little bit different variations in the base game. And so to see more maps and more terrain, I'm assuming that's heavily based uh, with the campaign style of things. So that's actually really cool. I think that was one thing that definitely needed a little bit of sprucing. Not that it was bad, but just that it was very interesting. So, I mean, the concept of the game, if you've made my rambling this far, is that you are hunting these creatures, you're killing them, or you're capturing them. If you capture them, you're getting gold. You can sell them, basically, essentially. If you kill them, you get resources to build stuff. Uh, but the gold allows you to upgrade your buildings during the uh, non-hunt phase, the settlement phase. Because you have five separate buildings, at least in the core game. I'm not sure if this is going to add more. I wouldn't be surprised. And the buildings then are just, they can do more. They can support more. They can heal more. They can sell more. You get more resources. Everything along those lines. So it's a balance between are you capturing, are you hunting? Because capturing also is going to potentially cause you damage. And unlike a lot of the other dungeon crawlers, after you finish a mission, you are not just automatically healed back to full health. You actually have to spend actions back at the settlement phase in order to heal. And it's... You know, it's difficult in that sense at times. You really cannot just slog this one out like you would other crawlers where my stats are better than yours. I'm just going to sit here and pound on you and I'm going to take some damage. And so what? I'll just mitigate it later. You cannot do that essentially with this. I have not played the arena head to head, uh, but it is definitely a twist on the skirmish thing because you're using dice and then you're also having meddling that they call here. Uh, where there are going to be edicts and whims that change the balance of the field, essentially, uh, metaphorically speaking, not literally. And you're using the creatures actually during the battles themselves, as opposed to just having a team of creatures. You have a hero with creatures. So again, it's another twist on things. That's kind of cool. Story-driven campaign, like we talked about. Uh, the demo campaign book is right here, so you can read that a little bit if you're interested. I believe one of my videos is down here. Uh, they commented about the fact that I'm wearing the box on my head, because why not, you know? If I'm going to get known for something, clearly that's going to be it, right? Um, I don't know. I can't resist nowadays, though. See, right? I just can't resist. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure I'll come up with some other clever gimmick, or you guys in the comment section can help me come up with some other clever gimmick. Or make a better picture that looks like these. That's cool. But anyway, maybe I'll be cool enough someday to have a cool gimmick or a cool design on the thumbnail. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And then they talk about the miniatures here and just everything. Shipping is going to be what it's... I mean, this is a big game. Especially if you're getting the big one. It's going to be seven. And they talk about some of their other games. So there you go. That is Levon Rising. Like I said, it's going to raise a lot of money. It's heavy miniature based. It's different in the sense that it is like stuff that's out there but is also dislike <laughs> unlike stuff <laughs> i'm doing really well tonight unlike other stuff that's out there in the first place so either way i mean it's gonna have eyes it's just the question of as we've been talking in the comment section too of the price inflation that's going along and i have to wonder too you know is price inflation not just going to be on the shipping side of things are people going to try to keep the shipping price down and inflate the game price itself a little bit to make people feel a little bit better that they're not paying an arm and a leg for shipping, even though maybe they're paying it in the game price. I don't know. That's just something that crossed my mind. I'm not saying that they're doing this here at all, but I wonder if you would see people do that in the future. So uh, there you go. That is Levon Rising. Check it out. And if it's of interest to you, let me know. And if you have any questions about it, I can maybe answer them in the comment section too. But uh, as well, yeah, there you go. That's it. That's this week. That's it. That is a long week. That is a lot of stuff. In case you missed it, check out my video from earlier in the week talking about the uh, 7 Plus. 
games that are going to be launching this month. And I mean, there's a lot of big hitters. This is a very expensive month, potentially, especially with all of the stuff coming out and all of the stuff sort of all grouping at once. August is going to be the same way. It's going to be a mess financially. <laughs> Pledge managers aside. Uh, so we'll just kind of see where things fall, how much pledges cost. I think there's a lot of delineation that way. I should probably put out a video talking about my June, maybe. I don't know. Do you guys care about that? Like, hey, this is what happened in my collection in June. Hey, this is the stuff I backed. Hey, this is the stuff I didn't back. I mean, is that cool or not? I don't know. Let me know if you're interested in seeing that. I never know if that gets views and people want to hear that or not. I, It's one of those things. Self-conscious about it. Uh, but uh, we'll see what else comes out. Obviously, the upcoming video for next week is going to be out tomorrow. And then we'll just kind of go from there. So let me know what you think. As always, let me know what you're backing. Let me know what you're not backing and why. Either way, thanks for watching. I'll see you around.